My name is Gina Morris, and I am one of the founding members of Kamloops Moms for Clean Air. Many of you may be wondering who we are. Kamloops Moms for Clean Air is not just a group for mums. We are for anyone who cares about clean air, healthy lungs, and preserving the freedom we have of running outside at any time we want to breathe deeply while doing all the things we love to do outdoors. We are also for anyone who recognizes that for the children of Kamloops to enjoy the same quality of life that we ourselves have enjoyed, we need to be active in taking care of the air they will breathe. The goal of Kamloops Moms for Clean Air is to ensure that children's health is at the forefront of everyone's mind when making decisions about the future of our community. Together, all of us here can begin a community dialogue around air pollution concerns in Kamloops, both current issues and the concerns we hold for the future of our community. As part of our educational effort, we are happy to be hosting this event today. We are honored to have Mr. Mel Rothenberger to introduce our guests and to moderate the question and answer periods throughout. Without any further delay, I will once again say thank you all for coming and I'll call on Mr. Rothenberger to begin. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gina. Good afternoon, everyone, and I'll add my welcome this afternoon to what is going to be a very busy program. First of all, I want to congratulate the Kamloops Mums for Clean Air on becoming established and right off the bat bringing two such fine, respected speakers uh, to present to us this afternoon. We, uh, as a community, are facing a major decision of course, and we all know that the Ajax mine is the probably the most controversial issue to face our community in many, many years. So it is uh, a, uh, a great opportunity uh, this afternoon to have people who can pre pre uh, provide us with uh, some comparisons, uh, being that they are from uh, the area of Salt Lake City, which has a uh, uh, a very large mine, not far, not as close to the community as uh, Ajax would be to Kamloops, but certainly they will provide, I think, a new perspective for us that will be uh, both interesting and informative. I'll tell you briefly how the afternoon is going to uh, progress so that we can uh, get right to it. Dr. Minch is going to speak first, and Dr. Minch, whom I'll, I'll uh, introduce more completely, uh, in a moment is the founder and president of Utah Physicians for a Healthy Environment. And we also have with us Sharice Udell, who is founder and president of Utah Mums for Clean Air. After Dr. Minch speaks, then we will uh, have some time for questions and answers to Dr. Minch. Then Dr. Uh, uh, Sharice Udell will speak next, and then we'll have some further questions and then a wrap up. So uh, we'll do it that way so that uh, we can get some engagement uh, going uh, as, as soon as we can without um, waiting for both speakers to uh, complete their remarks. So uh, with that, I will first introduce uh, Dr. Brian Minch, as I mentioned, the founder and president of Utah Physicians for Healthy Environment, uh, which is a group promoting science-based health education and interventions that result in measurable improvements to the environment. Some of the best studies on the relationship between public health and air quality have come out of Utah as a result of their efforts. Dr. Mitch graduated from the University of Utah Medical School in 1977, specializing in intensive care medicine and anesthesiology. He is a former instructor at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, a former department chair of anesthesiology at Holy Cross Hospital, and is now in private practice in Salt Lake City. Dr. Minch. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming. I think I've been treated like royalty from the people who escorted me here and whose home I'm staying in. Um, and I bring you greetings from Salt Lake City, Utah, United States of America, that small, obnoxious country south of the border. <laughs> um, 
I also bring you greetings from the Utah Physicians for a Healthy Environment. I'm their president, and for those of you who question whether or not I'm the president, here's a copy of my birth certificate. <laughs> Now, some of you may be asking yourself, and rightly so, what is somebody from the United States doing coming up here to Canada when you're clearly coming from a nation of morons up to a nation that appears to have at least uh, some common sense dictating public policy? Now, uh, Canada doesn't seem to invade other countries for no reason. Canada doesn't seem to have the world's worst, worst gun laws. Uh, Canada doesn't have a legitimate political party called the Tea Party. So <laughs> why on earth would someone from the United States come up here to Canada to try and tell you anything about any issue? And I wouldn't disagree with that sentiment at all, especially when uh, we elected this person to be our president twice. And uh, we came very close to electing this person, our vice president. <laughs> and furthermore, recent polls indicate that 27% of Americans think God influenced the outcome of the Super Bowl. 18% of Americans believe the earth is the center of the universe. One third of Texans, the biggest state in our 48 states down below, <coughs> believe that humans roam the earth with dinosaurs. Now I admit that's not a real confidence builder for you to listen to anything that I might say. So I'm going to apologize for all of that, but I do have a perspective that might in fact be helpful to you in this issue that I think has profound long-term if not permanent implications for your community. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm an anesthesiologist. And as such, I share uh, a great deal of professional enthusiasm with Gene Wilder here as Dr. Frankenstein in one of my favorite comedies, Young Frankenstein. Um, <coughs> anesthesiology is the science and the art of bringing people as close to death as they'll ever come and yet still keeping them alive. So when things go well, I have the same sort of professional excitement and exuberance that uh, Gene Wilder had when, Dr. <laughs> when Frankenstein arises from the operating room table. Now, the theme of Frankenstein, I think, is particularly appropriate for this issue because Salt Lake City, Utah, has lived right next door to a living, breathing, unfortunately, Frankenstein monster for the last 100 years. It's called the Rio Tinto Copper Mine. And um, this is a picture of it. It's the lo second largest open pit copper mine in the world. We have the juxtaposition of this enormous copper mine being within about 15 to 20 miles of literally one and a half million people. There's no other comparable, comparable juxtaposition anywhere in the world. There are some profound implications for our community because of that. Let me give, share some of that with you. This copper mine, the Rio Tinto copper mine, is the largest source of heavy metal contamination of our air, water, and soil. Uh, the EPA, which is our Federal Environmental Protection Agency, that's the acronym, which is the federal agency that is supposed to protect us from all kinds of toxins related to environmental exposures, they estimate that our exposure is about 200 million pounds of toxic releases every year from this mine. Now that sounds like a lot, and it is. And incidentally, the pictures to this backdrop are all pictures of this mine. The Kennecott mining operations are the second largest source of toxic releases in the entire United States. And primarily because of Kennecott, Utah ranks second among all the 48, or excuse me, all the 50 states uh, for toxicity, and the county that we live in, Salt Lake County, is second amongst all counties in the United States for toxic releases. Forbes magazine is not exactly considered an environmental tree hugger magazine. They ranked us ninth most toxic city in the United States primarily because of this mine. 
Now, you look at your own community with beautiful pictures like this, and I've been escorted around this community for, for the last day and a half, um, and I start thinking, my goodness, why would you take vistas that look like this and this and turn them into things that look like this? Because this is the vista from my house. If I look one direction, that slide I showed you at the beginning, that's what I see. If I look the other direction from my house, this is what I see. Now, I, I read online some comments from some of your community leaders, and so I wrote them down. Uh, I do think they need to be done in the most sustainable way possible. Does this look like it to anybody as sustainable? Uh, I read comments like this, there, there's no question there's an impact while the mine is operating. Well, I've got news for you, the impact never stops. The mine may stop and likely will stop at some point, but the impact to the community will never end. And here are some of the reasons why. We have a smelter that's associated with my, this mine that releases 6,235 pounds per year of lead, and over the course of 20 years, that's 125,000 pounds of lead disseminated throughout the greater Salt Lake area through a course of, of 20 years. Through the course of 100 years, who knows how much lead has been distributed throughout the community. But lead is going to be the, one of the things that you're going to have in your community as a result of this mine. Our Center for Disease Control and Prevention which is one of our federal agency has stated publicly, no amount of lead exposure is safe. None, absolutely none. There's not a concept of a safe amount of lead exposure. And yet, this mine pours out into our community over a 20 year period, 125,000 pounds of this toxic heavy metal into our community. Now, a lot of you may know that heavy metals like lead are not combustible, they are not destroyed, they actually um, steadily accumulate in the environment such that the overall toxic burden of the community accumulates and increases steadily year after year after year after year. These studies were published just recently showing a direct correlation between atmospheric soil levels, in other words, dust kicked up into the atmosphere, and blood lead, lead levels in children. And another study showed that in multiple cities throughout the United States, the blood lead levels in children actually go up in the summer months when dust is kicked up, and then they start to go down again. So we have proven that lead in soil and in dust actually is translated into higher blood lead levels in children. Well, what really does that mean? It means something very profound. Even tiny amounts of lead are associated with surprisingly large decreases in IQ. Kennecott's heavy metal emissions are a serious issue for our community. This study, published just about three months ago, made this very tight correlation. 0.2 micrograms per deciliter of blood is associated with one IQ point loss. Now let me put this in perspective. Medical studies over the last 30 years have shown again and again and again that lead is toxic at any level. It used to be considered a safe level of lead to have 75 micrograms per cubic meter, or excuse me, per deciliter of lead in your blood. That was the threshold that was considered safe by our EPA. As medical studies advance, we keep ratcheting it down, and so the, lat the latest study shows that 0.2 micrograms per deciliter of lead in the blood can be correlated directly with an IQ loss of one point. The average person here is probably sitting with about somewhere between two and four micrograms uh, per deciliter of blood of, uh, of lead in their blood and other heavy metals. All of you here <clears throat> are less intelligence, intelligent because of the, the lead in your blood and you think, oh my goodness, <laughs> lead must be rampant in the United States of America, otherwise why would they be so stupid? <laughs> but you have a choice to avoid that problem. But this is how, t how sensitive 
The brain is, to the insult of lead and other heavy metals toxicity, 0.2 micrograms per deciliter of lead in your blood is associated with an IQ loss of one point. Now, I don't know about you, but every single IQ point that I have, I want to keep. And I need everybody, I, everybody that, are, that I'm friends with, I'd like them to have a little more IQ points too. I'd like to have our entire nation have a few more IQ points. You can't afford to lose any of yours. And I think if you look in the faces of your children, you don't want them to lose them either. Rio Tinto's toxic tailings ponds cover an enormous acreage outside of Salt Lake City. If you try and estimate the cost to society of the pollution that comes from our mine, using this formula that was published by our federal agency at about $300,000 per ton of particulate matter emitted. Now this is an old figure. This is a figure that was generated in about the mid-1980s. That was long before we understood the full extent of the health consequences of air pollution, and it was in 1985 dollars. Their estimate is the cost to society is $300,000 per ton of particulate matter emitted, and this mine, based on this old methodology, is probably costing our community about $4 billion in 1985 dollars. So look at that mine and start thinking of it in these kinds of terms. Now we have, in addition to the enormous pit and the waste rock piles, we have 9,000 acres of tailings impoundments. This is a, a photograph of the base of one of them. To put that in perspective, look at that water tower. This is how tall they are. This is how dominating they are of our landscape. Uh, another angle of our waste rock piles. Our mine is so ugly, I'm happy to say that, I mean it's unequivocally ugly, that a picture of our mine was used by Robert Redford in an ad that he paid for in the New York Times to try and persuade the state of Alaska not to build this mine in Bristol Bay, Alaska. He clearly points out, do you want Bristol Bay, Alaska to look like this? But this is what I live next door to. So I was uh, trolling the internet, looking for stories of communities that are fighting mines, and I saw this quote from a, an official in the state of Wisconsin. Mining is the economy of the past. We are repeating the mistakes of the 19th century. Now I'm just going to cover very quickly the issue of acid mine drainage. Uh, weathering waste rock produces acid. Acid leaches metals. Uh, into the groundwater, into the fugitive dust from this project, from the mine, and from the tailings piles, and this process will go on forever. If you let that mine happen, the story's not ever closed. It will go on for decade after decade after decade after decade after they have left. Now, in addition to the issue of acid mine drainage and the overall uh, pollution of our ecosystem with heavy metals. Uh, this picture of our waste rock piles is standing about maybe five or six miles away. Ten miles away from that, all the groundwater has been contaminated. This is the largest contamination of groundwater in the world related to mining. There's nothing you can do with that water. It's absolutely useless for a 10 mile distance away from these waste rock piles. So, this is one of my favorite cartoons from the New Yorker magazine. <laughs> yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time we created real shareholder value. <laughs> let, let me adapt that to this situation. Yes, Kamloops got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time we created real Ajax shareholder value. All right, now, I want to then to take a little bit of a detour and talk in more general terms about the issue of what are the health consequences of air pollution. And our uh, medical advisor is Dr. Stephen Colbert, who made one of my favorite statements about Canada. He said, I don't like to report news from Canada because mostly the headlines are always screaming, everything's still okay. <laughs> uh, but I will say that I was kind of surprised to see this as I drove through Kamloops. <laughs> I know our medical system's a little different than yours, but this kind of took me by surprise. I thought, you guys are really doing some great work up here. Then when I saw this magazine in the airport, I thought, 
gee, this is a real happening place. Um, so I'm not going to sell Canada short anymore. Let's talk about what air pollution is doing to Salt Lake City. This is a picture of our famous Temple Square. This is not a heavenly mist. This is not uh, God's fine, foggy, um, <clears throat> romantic, Londonish fog. This is deadly air pollution. And you can't, so when it gets this bad, you can't literally see in front of your face, as this photograph illustrates. Well, I noticed that air quality was an issue recently for Kamloops, and apparently that's not only true for just this particular day, January 16, 2013. Air pollution is a big problem all the time. Now, this is a fraternity stunt down at Brigham Young University. Sorry. Sorry. The point of this is air pollution is the result of lighting things on fire. Just about everything you can think of, if you're going to light it on fire, you're going to have a problem with air pollution. Obviously, this guy has a problem with pollution. In the same way, there's no safe number of cigarettes that you can smoke. There's no safe amount of air pollution that you, that you can breathe. Um, this is a graph of what your monitoring stations in the Kamloop area have shown uh, for the last nine months, approximately, from April 2012 to January 2013. This blue line is the World Health Organization's recommended threshold for safe air. You can see that you are already frequently above that. Now, bear in mind, as I talk about a few medical studies here in the next few minutes, you'll hear over and over again this number, 10 micrograms per cubic meter of PM2.5. PM2.5 stands for particulate matter, 2.5 stands for the size of the particles, and that's 2.5 microns and smaller. Very tiny particles. So this is what's going on in Kamloops right now. This is the World Health Organization's threshold for what is considered safe air. You're already above it. Air pollution contributes to four of the five major leading causes of death. Heart attacks, strokes, lung disease, and cancer. Now, to understand how this happens, I think it's worthwhile for us to kind of dive underneath the microscope and look at what happens at the cellular level. If we do that, we see this. Well, not, you won't see this under the microscope, but this is kind of <laughs> an illustration of what's going on biochemically. If you look at a cell, that there's an ongoing balance between the antioxidant capacity within that cell and its metabolic needs which generate free radical production. If you have a deficiency in antioxidant capacity or an excess of free radical production, then this delicate balance starts to shift. And that's when the cell can get in trouble. And if you've got a cell in trouble, then you're likely to have all the organs, next, or the, all the organs made up by those kinds of cells to be in trouble as well. And be, to be more specific, this is the way it happens underneath the micros microscope. Here's a cell cell membrane, nucleus of the cell, intracellular uh, structures like the mitochondria, which is the power plant of the cell. These tiny particles are so small that they can penetrate right through the cellular membrane and start to wreak chemical havoc with the subcellular structures, including getting into the nucleus of the cell and causing this imbalance, which we have come up with a $10 word for it. We call it oxidative stress. You've heard of that term perhaps in relationship to a lot of diseases, but that seems to be the common um, biologic pathway by which air pollution has its health effects. And in this issue, size is everything. Um, the smaller the particle, the more damage it can do because you can inhale it more deeply into your lungs. That means you get a bigger dose of it. And then when you get down to those cells, if it's the smaller particles can get through that cellular membrane, and start to alter cellular function more easily than bigger particles. Smaller particles are more toxic. But then these particles can also have things attached to them that enhance their toxicity. So the smallest particles we measure we call ultrafines. They're not membrane bound and so they can get direct access into these subcellular structures like the mitochondria and the DNA and enhance their toxicity. But Metals are often attached to these particles as well, and that's why it's very relevant to your circumstance, because all the dust that will be inevitably kicked up by this mine will have a higher concentration of heavy metals 
than just regular garden variety dust. These metal particles can be attached to these dust particles and that enhances the oxidative stress, therefore enhancing the toxicity and ramping up the health consequences. And even further, metal concentrations in mining waste particles actually increase with decreasing, excuse me, decreasing particle size. That means not only are the smaller particles more toxic because they're small, but it appears as though they also have higher concentrations of metals attached to them. So that's an enhancement of the toxicity you would get from regular particulate matter. Here's a, a photograph of the base of our 9,000 acres of tailings piles. Now, back up from the microscope a little bit. This oxidative stress at the cellular level causes a low-grade inflammatory response that affects the entire ar arterial system. And if it, if it affects all your arteries, then it affects all of your organs, and um, especially your, your most important organs. And I'm going to put you on the spot, because you are such a gentleman to help us set this up. I'm going to give you an, an, a, an opportunity to answer this question. <laughs> Name your three favorite organs. <laughs> And don't lie. <laughs> Actually, this is a family show. Lie. <laughs> what are your three favorite organs? Oh, my heart. Okay, that, I, that's a good place to start. What else? Uh, lungs. Lungs? Um, don't say the third one. <laughs> <laughs> your brain, absolutely. You're one of the first people to actually get all three right. This is an actual photograph of the, the pollution that we're subjected to sometimes during the winter in Salt Lake City. This is our city center. So what does pollution do to the lungs? It increases the rates of asthma uh, and virtually every other lung disease you can think of, including increasing the rates of attacks, uh, aggravating the attacks, increasing the rates of hospitalization. But it does actually more than that because children who grow up with air pollution are less likely to develop their full adult lung function if they grew up in the formative years between birth and about the age of 18, when your lungs reach their maximum capacity. So it isn't just a temporary situation. It isn't an aggravation of existing lung disease. It actually can precipitate lung disease, and it can actually inhibit lung function, and that effect appears to be permanent. So air pollution is associated with increased rates of hospitalization and death from respiratory diseases throughout the age spectrum, from neonates to the elderly, and the correlation between these outcomes and one of the pollutants, ozone, is still found at concentrations that are as small as one-third of what our, quote, national standards are to keep people safe. So the point being that it doesn't take much air pollution at all to start affecting profoundly lung function and precipitating all these lung diseases. How does pollution affect the heart and the blood vessels? For one, it increases significantly the rates of blood clots in the legs, deep vein thrombosis. Um, this is another picture of how bad pollution can get in our city, overlooking our oil refineries. Within literally about a half an hour after an air pollution spike, blood pressure starts to rise. Now, if I took everybody here and I jacked up your blood pressure about three millimeters of mercury, most of you wouldn't feel any of that. But some of you who are on the verge of having a heart attack or a stroke, if that's what happens, then the rates of strokes and heart attacks in the rest of the community start to rise. And in fact, we see that epidemiologically. We see rates of strokes and heart attacks increase literally within hours after an increase or a spike in air pollution. And here's a fascinating relationship, well established now, between air pollution concentrations and the signature outcome of air pollution, which is a sudden death from a heart attack. Plotted on this axis is the concentration of particulate matter from three different sources. Cigarette smoke, secondhand cigarette smoke, and air pollution. Increasing concentration on this, this axis, increasing number of deaths on this, this axis. First thing you ought to notice about this graph is that it never goes down to zero. That means as soon as you get any air pollution at all, as soon as you get any exposure to cigarette smoke or secondhand cigarette smoke, it all behaves the same way. You get any exposure at all, we see statistical evidence of sudden death from any air pollution at all. 
The other thing that I want you to notice about this curve is that the steepest part of this curve is at low doses. <coughs> so that in a community whose air quality is usually pretty good, and I would say that yours is usually pretty good, if you're on this part of the curve, making it a little bit worse puts you on the steepest part of that curve and has more public health consequences. Now when the air pollution is just god awful, like it is for us sometimes, then the curve starts to flatten out. But Kamloops is really pretty much on this part of the curve, meaning increments in air pollution in your community will have profound effects on public health. For every one microgram per cubic meter of PM2.5, community mortality rates rise between 1 and 1.4 percent. Well, that means if you go back to that curve of what your air quality monitors are showing you right now, and you average maybe 10 micrograms per cubic meter, that means that your air pollution right now is responsible for an increase in your community mortality rates of about 10 percent, maybe as high as 14 percent. That's the air pollution that you're currently experiencing right now. The community mortality rates stay elevated for 30 days after a short-term spike in air pollution because that inflammatory process doesn't dissipate. There's no threshold below which there's no health effect, there's no safe level of exposure, and our estimation using the formula published by the American Heart Association, it, Heart Association is that in our community as many as 2,000 people die prematurely every year because of our air pollution. And in addition to that, in Salt Lake City, our estimate is that it shortens the life expectancy of every one of us about two years. Air pollution has been shown to cause inflammation in the heart muscle itself of young, healthy adults. Totally healthy. The healthiest of the healthy. Air pollution has been shown to cause an inflammation of the heart muscle. And it decreases cardiovascular fitness. Um, this is one of the most remarkable studies done with regard to the health impacts of air pollution. The only part of the body where you can actually look directly at these little tiny blood vessels that we call arterioles is in the back of the eye. As you get older, or if you have diabetes, or if you have high blood pressure, those little tiny arteries throughout your body, but visible in the back of your eye, tend to get narrower and they constrict, and that compromises blood flow. These researchers took over 4,000 patients and they started to analyze, based on how much air pollution they were exposed to, what the caliber of these blood vessels were. And they found this correlation. For every three micrograms per cubic meter of PM2.5, now that's about a third of what your annual average is. A third. That was associated with narrowing of these blood vessels equivalent to seven years of aging or an increase in blood pressure of three millimeters of mercury. So the blood vessels, uh, the little tiny microscopic arterioles that basically keep you alive and all of your important organs functioning is very sensitive to this kind of an insult. So what it, we mentioned the, the brain is an important organ to a few of you. Um, you've seen this kind of a slide before. Well, this is your brain on drugs, of course. This is your brain on air pollution. <laughs> and uh, literally, air pollution causes dirty minds. And here's why. Um, building a brain is about a 20-year process. But the most important part of that process is the first three months after conception. That's when the infrastructure, the architecture of the brain is being formed. And just like building a skyscraper, if you don't build the foundation correctly, it doesn't matter what you do later on, you're never going to have a skyscraper that does what it's supposed to be, supposed to be doing. And the brain is much the same way. If during that critical window of development, you don't have the opportunity to have a, a fetus that is protected from environmental insult and the brain does not develop like it should, you can never make up for that. So looking at studies on relating air pollution, fetal development, uh, to the human brain, we find these kinds of studies. Air pollution components can penetrate deeply into the brain and kick up this inflammatory response that actually affects brain tissue. And there are a couple reasons uh, why it does that. One, many of the particulate matter comp or many of the tiny particles in air pollution actually have, as I mentioned earlier, 
Uh, heavy metals adsorb to them. Heavy metals are particularly toxic to neurons or brain cells. So um, if we take a brain cell from a mouse and we tease it out and we look at it, it looks like a tree. It looks like a fruit tree because it's got all these branches and all these little blossoms at the end. And the more branches and the more blossoms that that brain cell has, then the more connections that brain cell can make with other brain cells and the smarter you are. Okay, so you want lots of branches on your brain cells. When you expose animals to air pollution, you can actually see a reduction in cellular complexity, less branches, less blossoms when you tease out individual brain cells. Then this was a remarkable study done by a group of researchers taking dogs and children growing up in Mexico City where it's really quite polluted compared to a comparable city in Mexico where there's much less air pollution. And they did MRI scans of the brains of these dogs and these children. And they found that the children showed, if they came from Mexico City, 57% of them showed these little white dots up here which you shouldn't see because they're indicative of reduced blood flow. They are hallmarks of later on neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Almost 60% of children growing up in Mexico City showed this kind of anatomic change. Same with the dogs, compared to only 8% of controls. So we can actually see underneath the microscope, we can see from MRI scans, this actually affects people's brains. If you look at it grossly, this is what an Alzheimer's brain looks like, and that's what a normal brain looks like. We repeat kind of these kinds of studies with mice and find that there's overall brain inflammation, typical of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, just from breathing typical Los Angeles, California kind of air pollution. Now, the brain also has an accessory pathway, which makes the brain even more vulnerable to air pollution, and that is not only can you get it into your lungs and then into your arterial system, but there's an accessory pathway to the brain directly from your nose in that air pollution breaks down the nasal mucosa here and those particles attach to the little nerves at the end of your nose and then they migrate directly back to the brain and can cause direct brain inflammation at the brain stem level. Long-term exposure to air pollution can lead to learning and memory problems and even depression from clinical studies. This is the brain of a normal teenage male breathing air pollution. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to look at that one for a minute. <laughs> However, this is also the brain of any typical male, whether they breathe air pollution or not. <laughs> um, this is a remarkable study done on elderly women, which showed that if women are chronically exposed to 10 micrograms per cubic meter of PM 2.5, again, that's about what you average here in Kamloops. If you're exposed chronically to that kind of exposure, then uh, elderly women are showing an acceleration of the cognitive decline that we normally see with aging, equivalent to about two years. So not only is it shortening your lifespan by about two years, but it's accelerating the, de the deterioration of your brain by a similar amount. Now we see that actually if a pregnant mother is exposed to certain kinds of air pollution, we can actually demonstrate higher rates of things like anxiety and behavioral and attention deficit disorders in children ages six to seven, even if the children don't breathe air pollution themselves, just if the mother did during pregnancy. And the mechanism is probably that it is causing what's called an epigenetic effect, which, which is something I'm gonna to get to in just a second here. Um, so if you have a teenager that's acting like this, which is the way normal teenagers act, by the way. But it may not be just because they're a teenager. It may be, in fact, that they've had this kind of an insult from things like air pollution. If you take people and attach uh, EEG monitors to them and then expose them to typical levels of diesel exhaust, diesel exhaust is going to be a big issue from this mine, we can actually see cortical stress measured by EEG to people exposed to typical urban levels of diesel exhaust. So think about this, most of the kids who get in a bus, go to school, are sitting in an environment where the diesel exhaust may be four times higher inside the bus than outside of the bus. 
They ride to school for 45 minutes. By the time they get there, they've got cortical stress going on, and they're not thinking as well as they could be otherwise, and long term, they're not going to learn as well. And this sort of remarkable correlation showed that modest amounts of nitrogen oxide exposure in children is correlated with a decrease in IQ points depending on whether or not you're talking about memory or gross motor skills, somewhere between eight and four and eight points even from modest levels of nitrogen oxide exposure, typically related to traffic. And then this remarkable study from the, the premier research institute of the United States, from the Harvard School of Public Health. Researchers took four groups of children in Boston and then divided them up according to how much air pollution they were exposed to. And they controlled for smoking in the home, socioeconomics, and all the other kinds of possible confounding variables that you might expect. And they found that just based on the amount of air pollution they were exposed to, the differences in IQ was as much as nine points from the most exposed group to the least exposed group. Now that's a game changer. That's a career changer. That's the difference between uh, being an anesthesiologist like me and being a real doctor like a cardiologist. <laughs> that's huge. That really does limit what a person can do in life. And this is just from the amount of air pollution that people are exposed to, especially children. Air pollution causes inflammation and oxidative stress in the brain, uh, measurable DNA damage, ultimately causing neurodegeneration even in children. And then just in the last year and a half, two studies now confirm that rates of autism are double amongst people more exposed to air pollution, for example, if they live close to a freeway. Finally, the area where air pollution may have the most profound effect on human health is what it does to genetic integrity, integrity in the development of the human embryo. If you don't do, remember anything else that I tell you today, I want you to remember this slide. These are placentas from mice that are exposed to, on this side, typical Los Angeles air, and then filtered air much cleaner. Now you can see there's a difference in the architecture of those placentas. Specifically, there's more congestion over here than there is over here. What's happening is on the maternal side of the placenta, the blood vessels are starting to constrict. And on the fetal side, to try and compensate for that, the blood vessels are starting to dilate. So the ratio between maternal and fetal surface ratios um, of the vascular architecture of the placenta declines by 20 to 40 percent. Well, if the blood supply to the fetus is being compromised, as this clearly indicates, then you can imagine that there can be some real consequence with the development of that embryo. And in fact, we see that. This study was repeated with mice that were exposed to air pollution prior to conception, not even during the pregnancy. They found the same phenomenon, just to a slightly less degree. So the relevant exposure here can actually be prior to conception. So what do we see clinically? We actually have a chemical marker now that indicates that the fetus is under stress when this sort of thing happens. And these are the kinds of clinical outcomes. We see, amongst women exposed to more air pollution, higher rates of vir virtually every adverse birth outcome you can think of. Preeclampsia, spontaneous abortions, stillbirths, intrauterine growth retardation, low birth weight syndrome, premature birth, and even smaller head size. We see higher rates of birth defects, like heart and neural tube defects. Now, again, diving back underneath the mic microscope for a minute. Telomeres, some of you may know what telomeres are. In fact, to those of you who know, somebody raise your hand and tell me what a telomere is. Come on, you have telomeres in Canada. <laughs> and I know some of you know, you're just being bashful. They're the red ends on the chromosome. Very good. What, Thank you. <laughs> telomeres are these repeating sequences of DNA that serve as end caps for your chromosomes, and they serve the same function as the caps on your shoelaces, which is to keep your shoelaces from unraveling. Every time the cell divides, you shave off a little bit of that telomere so that the cell can only divide a certain number of times before it can't do it anymore, and game's over for that cell. Now, there's an enzyme called telomerase reverse transcriptase that actually maintains your ability to uh, keep your telomeres in good condition. So if you have an organism 
that uh, really has lived long past the point that it should have died, but it's got great telomerase reverse transcriptase, that's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> then that organism can live long past the point that it otherwise should have died, and the best example of that, of course, is Keith Richards. <laughs> He must have world-class reverse transcriptase, okay? <laughs> Air pollution shortens the length of telomeres. If you take a group of people who are occupationally exposed to air pollution, like specifically people who are out in traffic in Europe, directing traffic, and they're exposed to auto exhaust all day long, you look at their cells under the microscope and they have shortened telomeres. To the extent that we can actually say their telomeres are about 10 years shorter than they should be based on just their air pollution ex exposure. And if you're 10 years older than you should be under the microscope, then no amount of plastic surgery is going to make up for that. <laughs> air pollution accelerates the aging process. Okay, here's a little factoid, because this is really a dismal presentation. <laughs> I apologize for it, but you've got to know what the science is telling us, okay? So here's a little something you may not have realized. The average American walks 900 miles per year uh, and drinks 22 gallons of beer. That means we get 41 miles per gallon. <laughs> I'll bet you didn't know that. I don't know what kind of miles per gallon you get in Canada, but I don't think it's that good. Okay, epigenetics is replacing the gene as biology's center of the universe. I want you to think of it this way. If the violin here is DNA, chromosomes, the genes, or the genotype, then epigenetics is the musician that is playing the violin. Uh, the end result, the phenotype, how that is, uh, organism is expressed, is the music that comes out. If the violin is broken, somebody steps on it, the music is over. You're in real trouble. But if the musician forgets the notes, or if she breaks her fingers, or she doesn't practice the way she should, then the music also is compromised, if not over. Epigenetics has this kind of a relationship to gene function, and the end result can be virtually the same as if you're damaging DNA. Well, how does this purport to air pollution? Researchers from the Columbia School of Public Health have been studying the impact of air pollution on fetal development for about the last 14 years. And they did a study where they took a gr two groups of women and they put air pollution personal monitors on them during the pregnancy. And then they uh, determined through sampling umbilical cord blood the amount of chromosomal damage or DNA addicts or epigenetic changes manifest by white blood cells in their umbilical cord at the time of birth. And what they found is that if women were exposed to more air pollution, you could see 50% more chromosomal changes damage this epigenetic change compared to a group of women who were not exposed to air pollution. This has profound lifelong implications. In the author's words, fetal susceptibility to DNA damage from air pollution has important implications for cancer risk and other developmental problems. Metals like nickel and chromium and arsenic. Arsenic is going to be one of the serious considerations from this mind. They are in fact carcinogens because of their epigenetic effect. Good health requires that all of your 20,000 genes play their proper and synchronized role. Uh, it's important that your genes play well with others. If they don't play well with others, you can have some real problems. Air pollution causes an alteration in the functioning of these genes, turning them on or off inappropriately, potentially affecting the lifelong health of people exposed. And here's the key. It can be passed on to subsequent generations. Prenatal air pollution exposure breathed by the mother actually alters the immune system of newborns. And that's probably the mechanism by which air pollution is, is associated with much higher rates of these cancers. Lung cancer, childhood leukemia, cervical cancer, brain cancer, stomach cancer, and breast cancer. Now I'm going to just highlight breast cancer for just a minute. There's a very tight correlation between air pollution and breast cancer. This study was done in Canada. So you, if you don't believe anything else I say, believe this study. 
The correlation is this, an increase of 25% in breast cancer rates for five parts per billion of nitrogen oxide. That's a very tiny amount. I don't know what your nitrogen oxide levels are here, but based on what your other monitors show, I'm guessing that this community has an increase in their blood, breast cancer rate of probably similar to Utah's, and that's about 125% increase, just statistically based on the amount of air pollution that you're exposed to. Um, and it's interesting that our air can be considered safe and still have a correlation of an increase in rates of 250%, and that's still safe according to our federal agencies. So that point illustrates the fact that federal standards, and I'm assuming the, the same is true in Canada, the federal standards are better than nothing, but they actually do not protect public health the way they should. Diesel exhaust is going to be a big issue here. Two very important studies show that diesel, in fact, is a carcinogen, has been relabeled as such, and that even typical amounts of exposure in an urban setting to diesel exhaust increases residents increase or rates of lung cancer about 50 percent and those who are occupationally exposed to it like are near these engines working with these engines have their rates of lung cancer increased 300 percent uh, more air pollution is associated with and likely contributes to the development of type 2 diabetes Prenatal air pollution exposure, in other words, what the mother is breathing during the pregnancy is associated with an increased rate of obesity in children after birth, even if the child doesn't bring, breathe any more air pollution. Rates of lupus, juvenile arthritis, sleep apnea, and suicide are increased with air pollution. All of this is, um, can be summarized with this kind of a message. A woman's short-term exposure to low-level pollution can affect the health of multiple generations through this epigenetic effect and the relevant exposure can actually precede conception. And what's critical here is it takes far smaller concentrations of exposure to change the epigenetic integrity as it does the genetic integrity itself and yet the end result can be the same. So tiny concentrations of pollution insults can actually have long-term permanent effects that can be passed on to subsequent generations. To put this in perspective, some of the most well-known pharmaceutical drugs are therapeutically relevant at tiny concentrations. Cialis, 30 parts per billion. Now, I know none of you take that, but I just use that as a reference, reference point. Paxil, 30 parts per billion. Albuterol, 2.1 parts per billion. Birth control pills, 35 parts per trillion. That's how powerful some of these compounds are. And then finally, we see episodic air pollution actually is associated with increased rates of DNA fragmentation measured in human sperm. So here's the bottom line. We are what our grandparents inhaled. And our grandchildren will be what we inhale. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I'm here, and then I'll sit down. Um, I had a fairly normal childhood. Not really. Uh, my father was a psychiatrist. <laughs> I had seven brothers and sisters, and they always picked on me, and now I have post-traumatic stress disorder, and this was the playground equipment in my backyard. <laughs> but other than that, it was a normal childhood. Nothing really important happened to me then for the next 49 years until I got a phone call from my wife in the operating room. Now, that doesn't uh, happen very often. If my wife calls me in the operating room, I know that something's really serious. So I was already having kind of a rough day in the operating room. She calls me up and she says, I have some really bad news. You need to sit down. So now I'm thinking, okay, she has run off to Mexico with the pool boy and taken all the money and all of our bank accounts and see you later, sucker. Uh, but then I knew, A, we didn't have a pool, we don't have a pool boy, we didn't have anything in our bank accounts. So she said, no, it's much worse than all those things. She says, our daughter has breast cancer. And um, so I was obviously speechless for about 30 seconds. Learned some of the details, and what I learned is that uh, she and our daughter didn't think that the recommended treatment uh, was really going to be what she needed. And so she said, will you please study the medical literature with her for the next month so we can find out what to do about it. And so we did. 
I sat down and she and I went over the medical literature intently and one of the things we found was that 80 to 90 percent of cancer is environmentally caused. So uh, that has really stuck with me for obvious reasons. Now, seven of my 12 most immediate family members have had cancer, including two of my children, including me twice. So this really puts a human face for me on this issue. And so when um, things get kind of rough, as they frequently do in the operating room, I think of why I'm engaged in this process, because <clears throat> I had to hold my daughter's hand on her 27th birthday and send her off to the operating room as she went for a double mastectomy. And she said to me, Dad, you're going to be okay. <laughs> But she's a fighter. I knew she was going to be okay, but I've never been the same since. And the reason why I'm here, and this is a matter of full disclosure, nobody's paying me to do this other than some citizens uh, pulled together some money and sent me a plane ticket. But I'm here because of what's happened to me shouldn't have to happen to you. And it's my obligation to try and help you prevent that from happening to your community. Thank you. She has a BA in Cultural Anthropology from uh, UC Berkeley and a pending Master's in Environmental Health and Social Ecology at Yale University. Welcome. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. And um, as uh, reiterated by uh, Dr. Minch, um, all of the moms um, in our group, um, send you greetings, and um, they're standing with you in solidarity to fight this mine. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about um, my experience um, in Salt Lake City and living adjacent to um, a mine that is so huge you can see it from outer space. And I'm also going to share with you um, some of the tactics that um, we have employed um, and things we have learned from collaborating with communities across the world who are fighting Rio Tinto specifically. So that's what I'm going to share with you today. Okay? So this is Salt Lake City where we live. Um, that is uh, almost a view from my house. Um, and uh, it's an absolutely gorgeous place when the air is clean. Just like I see that this is a beautiful valley as well. Um, and I see very much the parallel between your valley and our valley, which is one reason why Gina contacted us to get involved. So unfortunately, this was um, the winter of 2007 in Salt Lake City. Um, this is coming down from um, the ski resorts and looking down into our valley. Um, this, um, we had just moved um, to Salt Lake City from California. I would lived in the Bay Area before um, where we have um, lots, obviously, of ocean breezes and you don't get the accumulation and we don't have anything called an inversion. And my husband, who grew up in Utah, had warned me that there will be these inversion things when we move to Utah, and it makes it just very cold. He didn't mention the pollution problem, I think, because he had forgotten, because he hadn't lived there for quite a while. Um, so the first winter we were there, um, <coughs> this happened. And I could taste the air. I could smell the air. I had the feeling I could almost cut the air, and I was like, why isn't anyone talking about this? There was no conversation, no public conversation about it whatsoever. And I kind of was just thinking, you know, this can't be healthy. And so I had this gut mother bear instinct that I was locking my kids in a windowless room full of chain smokers. And sure enough, it turns out that that gut instinct was absolutely right on because Dr. Brian Minch, I didn't know him at the time, but he wrote an op-ed soon after that inversion. And he described in that op-ed, um, a few things. One, that our children will never develop their full lung capacity growing up in the Wasatch Front. Two, that they would statistically have two years shaved off their lives from growing up there. And then, go ahead. And then third, that a red air alert day, like you saw in that picture, is virtually the equivalent of smoking a half a pack of cigarettes. As a mother, that idea so profoundly disgusted me 
I looked down, my little baby, she was about that. That is actually her. And actually, this is Photoshopped. <laughs> I don't encourage smoking, obviously. Um, she was actually, we are at the beach, and she's eating sand in that picture. And so that's why she has that funny face. Um, but she was about that old when I read that op-ed by Dr. Minch. And I imagined a cigarette dangling from her mouth. I had that exact image. She was on the floor innocently playing with her blocks. And it just hit me in the gut that I had to do something, and I had to do it now. And so I sat down. And actually, first, actually, I thought, we'll see, what can I do? I can organize moms, because I'm a mother. We just recently moved uh, to Salt Lake City, but I was already involved in La Leche League and at the preschool, the neighborhood. And I thought, OK, I'm, gonna, I'm sure other mothers feel the same way I do. I'm going to reach out to moms. And let's see, we could call the group. Let's see, uh, Utah Moms against air pollution, no, let's be for something, you tell moms for clean air. I said, oh, that's a good name. So I called my husband on the phone and I said, honey, do you think I should organize moms on this clean air issue? Do you think I should start a group called Utah Moms for Clean Air? And he said, sure, honey, that sounds great. I've got to go to a lunch appointment, click. And so now six years later, here we are doing what we're doing. And so Utah Moms for Clean Air was born that day because I sat right down and wrote a very heartfelt letter, sent it out to about the 100 moms that I knew. And clearly, I tapped a nerve in the community because a minute after hitting the send button, I started getting responses back from people. So the question then for me was, where is this pollution coming from? And so as I started to research this, and, and right, right away, actually, a, a mother at the preschool, her husband worked with Brian. And so we got connected up immediately within um, our, our groups, both starting at the same time. And um, so we started to learn, you know, where was this pollution coming from? And um, basically what we found, and I'm giving you the, um, the very simplified version of this, but basically it comes from tailpipes and comes from industry. It's about 50-50. Um, tailpipes is not just um, individual cars, but it's also UPS trucks. It's uh, the mail trucks. It's fire trucks. It's airplanes. Um, it's anything that has a tailpipe. Um, and then the other 50% approximately was coming from industry. And it was very apparent flying in and out of Salt Lake City and just driving through our valley, you can see the industry. We have the Kennecott Mine that you can, as I said, see from outer space. We have a number of refineries that are right, in, right immediately adjacent to Salt Lake City. Um, and so we started learning um, about, how do we get to that slide? That's not the right one, is it? Where are we? We're there. We actually want to be here first. Yeah. Um, <coughs> So, um, so we started to look into, um, you know, the causes of air pollution, and, um, and then we started to investigate deeper. And of course, Rio Tinto came right up, you know, as the bullseye for us because they are the number one polluter in our valley. Not only are they one of the number one polluters in our valley, they are in our state and they are in our nation. They take up a huge amount of uh, they, they produce a disproportionate amount of air pollution for the United States of America, most of it concentrated right in our valley. And so I started to look at, um, you know, um, air quality vis-a-vis -vis, um, the mine. And I'm going to focus on that because also it's relevant to you. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to talk about is, and I'm sure you've heard this already, but, um, you know, of course there's benefits to having this mine in our community, right? I mean, you, you've been hearing about all the benefits. I'm sure you've heard more than you want to hear about all the benefits. But yes, there are jobs, and people need jobs. There's tax revenue to the community. That's also obviously positive. And then there's also philanthropy that um, these um, big corporations, they have extra money, and they are often very willing to share it with the community. Some of it, anyhow. Um, and so those are some of the benefits of having um, a big company, a big mine in your community. Um, most of those, or all, all three of those things, are all temporary because, of course, the mine um, can't go on forever. Um, I think your proposed mine has 23 years. So for 23 years, it will provide those three things. On the other side, over those 23 years, and as Brian said, some of those forever, for as long as um, your family lineages will be here, um, you're going to be suffering some of these things on the right. So I like to think of it as a scale, right? So we're going to measure out and see what are the pluses and minuses of having a mine in your community. So over on the right-hand side, the things that are also more permanent, you have the air pollution, the water pollution, the health costs, um, the ecological damage, the aesthetics. You saw how ugly it looks. Um, the job losses, um, because not only will um, the mine, well, when the mine creates pollution in the valley, there are companies that are going to refuse to move there. We're going to actually um, 
be a less attractive place to the low polluting um, economy, for example. Um, it's also going to lead to property devaluation. So for all of you living up on this hill right here, um, it's pretty much guaranteed your property values are going to take a big hit. Because frankly, who's going to want to buy your house at, at the rates that, that you would, could offer it now once a mine is right behind it with all the risks that are associated with it? Um, and then also you're going to have reclamation costs. So one of the things I really want to point out here too is most of the things on the right hand side are what are called externalities, negative externalities. So a lot of that comes from the, the very fact that most mining companies and certainly Rio Tinto, rather than paying the true cost of doing their business, like to cut corners and cheat and externalize these costs onto the community. They could avoid most, if not all of those things, if they actually put in the proper control equipment, the proper mitigation, um, and could avoid all those things. But they choose not to, so they can send greater profits from Utah back to their London offices. So this is called a negative externality, and frankly, I fundamentally have a huge problem with it on a moral and ethical level. Um, what's interesting is in the United States, what they're doing basically is legal, but as I said, I would argue it's not moral or ethical to cause harm to innocent others, and that is exactly what the mine is doing. Um, so I'll go into a little more detail about, um, so Kennecott in our community, um, it's in many ways feels like it's become a one company town, and we're a big city. So we're the capital of the state of Utah, yet it feels very much like Kennecott has permeated every sector, whether it's the radio, our government agencies, schools, universities, sports teams. They have penetrated everywhere. Um, and I'm going to explain that more later. But as far as what, so of course one of the big things they say is we're going to provide all these jobs. So they are providing these jobs right now. We're currently in an issue where they're applying for expansion. So they have a permit in right now to expand by 30%. So we're actually in, uh, we're ahead of you in this phase, but right now we're trying to resist this expansion. And so again, they're bringing up the same things that the Ajax mine is bringing up to you. We're going to provide all these jobs. We're going to have more jobs um, with the expansion. But Brian and um, some of his colleagues did some um, digging into the data, and it turns out that Rio Tinto Kennecott, one of the world's largest mines in the world, employs less than 1% of our population. The Sizzler Steakhouse in our valley employs more people than the mine. Okay? So when they say they provide jobs, yes, they'll provide some jobs. But again, what I saw at that scale, at what cost? And are these the kind of jobs that you want? And are these long-term jobs? Or are they going to be short-term jobs? So what's also interesting, and then you look, and you see that Rio Tinto, you saw the little tiny slice that was barely noticeable on the pie chart of how many jobs they supplied. Now look at how much pollution they create. If you break that down, it's 14,500 pounds of pollution per job. That is on the next slide, isn't it? OK, it's not on that one. So um, you want to go back on that? So Chevron, who do you guys have Chevron gas here in yeah. Canada? OK. Um, go back to that one slide where there. Next one. There we go. OK. So Chevron is the next biggest polluter in our valley. And they're only responsible for 3%. So funny enough, Brian has received calls from some of the smaller polluters on our valley that said, we're unhappy with Rio Tinto Kennecott because they're hogging up the airshed and we can't get permits to pollute. <laughs> Is that funny? <laughs> There's an irony in that. So, um, so as you can see, um, Rio Tinto is a huge airshed uh, air hog and you can pretty much guarantee that the mine that's being proposed in your community will also be an airshed hog. Um, our mine has some things, um, a smelter and a coal fire power plant, actually three, um, two of them they're decommissioning, that of course increase those um, emissions that you probably will not have here, although I hear that there's a possibility that a smelter could be built. And more than likely, they're not asking for it now. There's a good chance they're going to ask for it down the line. And I'm going to talk to you about getting the camel's nose underneath the tent. Um, and about that issue um, in a little bit. Okay. Okay, so um, in fighting Rio Tinto, um, 
I was contacted by the London Mining Network a couple years ago. And they're a London-based organization that monitors um, the mining companies that are out of England. One of them is Rio Tinto. And they asked if we would come to London and talk about our experience at their shareholders meeting. So we'll organize everything for you, we'll get you proxy shareholder status, and all you need to come and tell your story. So I said, okay, free trip to London, I'll go. I don't know what we can accomplish, but we'll see. So I went. Um, we had two other moms with me. We, bought, we brought our own photographer who photographed, uh, who photo documented the whole experience. And actually, the things that I, that, A, it was great to actually confront the, share, the, the uh, board and the CEO and give them a piece of my grizzly bear mama mind. I'll tell you, that was super fun. But um, what was actually, what really I came back with that was so fascinating, and this is one I want to share with you, is the London Mining Network brought people in communities from all over the world where Rio Tinto was operating. So for the first time ever, I was able to speak to other communities that were experiencing Rio Tinto so that we realized that our situation was not unique. We were not alone in fighting this and nor, like I said, was our experience a singular experience. This was a pattern. What they were doing in our community was being repeated all over the world. So there were activists that year from Indonesia, from Mongolia, um, from Michigan in the United States, um, and there was a group from, from South Africa. And so what I learned from that, talking to all these groups, is that these multinational mining corporations have a mining playbook. I don't think it's literally written down, but I'll tell you the tactics they employ, they employ in every city, every state where they're working, and I guarantee you that if they're not doing it already, they're going to be employing these tactics here in your community. So I'm really curious with nods of heads as I go through this list, I'll be really curious if you say yes, this is happening, yes, this is happening, no, this isn't happening, okay? My bet is most of the stuff is already happening, okay? First is divide and conquer, okay? So what they did, um, for example, don't go so fast, because I'm gonna, getting ahead of me there, Brian. Um, so so um, what's really interesting, um, Utah Moms for Clean Air was, uh, along with Dr. Minch with Utah Physicians for a Healthy Environment, were the most vocal um, opponents against the mine expansion. I was president of the organization for the first uh, year, and then I passed the torch on to another mom in our group. Rio Tinto called her up and said, we want to come, we, we, let me back up. When we first started our group, um, we got so much publicity that all the big polluters called us in to meet us, to find out who are these moms, what are they up to, kind of to assess us, I believe. Um, one of those companies was Rio Tinto. Um, we um, then went off and were doing our business, and then again, so a year later, um, Rio Tinto calls our new president and invites her to come and meet with them alone. And she goes. I actually didn't know this was happening. Um, she went and she brought a couple other moms. And they felt, these moms who are a little more conservative in their approach than I am, um, thought that working with um, the uh, community liaison person and some of the other staff at Rio Tinto, that they could affect more change by those conversations than they could by the rabble rousing we were doing on the outside, by writing op-eds, op I guess you call them opinion pieces here, holding demonstrations out in front of their plants, demonstrations at our air quality meetings, etc. So they were in these meetings for, it went on for a few months, and then um, it came out that there was a hearing in Magna, which is, would be kind of the equivalent of your town here as far as its proximity to the mine. And I told the other moms, we've got to go to this meeting we need to get as many people there, we need to ask hard questions, and we need to make a presence. And they said, oh no, we can't do that because we're in negotiations with them, and if we do that, it's gonna jeopardize those negotiations and those relationships we've worked so hard on building. And I said, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> we're going, I'm going, I'm going. And whatever moms wanna come with me can come. So I bought a, we brought a posse of moms, and there were kids, and we had a group there, and we asked hard questions. Well, it turned out that the other moms were not happy with me for doing that. And um, without going into all the gory details, our group split into two, and our group actually almost imploded. 
We almost, um, I, I was almost ousted from the organization and almost walked away from it entirely. Unfortunately, I had support behind me that said, no, you know, you can't leave. Mm -hmm. You've got to stick with this. And so what we ended up doing, the board said, okay, let's just do a spin on another group. And that group can be the more conservative group, the, the one that wants to work more behind the scenes. And um, so that's, ended up what that's what ended up happening. It was extremely painful, and um, it nearly destroyed everything that we had created. And I would say Rio Tinto knew that. They saw the division, and they went and stoked it. And that is exactly what they do. So what they're going to do is whether it's internally in a group that is strong, that they'll go in and stoke division, or if it's between different groups, or if it's between neighbors, or between business leaders, or people on city council, you're going to see, and my guess is, have you seen that already? Yes. Okay, well that is one of their tactics. So what you need to do is outwardly you need to be united. And I know that's not easy. Okay? And I know that there's so the groups that are against the mine, you together must be united. And so one of the things that we learned from that is you never meet with Rio Tinto alone. You go with all the other groups in an open forum and you have dialogue, but you do not go in there alone. They will offer you money. They will offer you all sorts of perks and benefits, and you'll feel all proud that I'm negotiating with the CEO of this big, huge mining corporation. But what they're going to do is they're then going to go behind your back, like at the shareholder meeting in London that I went to, and say, oh, we have community consent at this group because this group, Utah Moms for Clean Air, you know, agreed that what we're doing is best mining practices and they support what we're doing. Okay, well, fortunately, that never happened. Okay, that is what they do because I've been to the shareholders meeting and I have seen in case study after case study where they list out the groups that are supporting um, the mine and they call that community consent. Why do they even bother doing that? Because shareholders get nervous and investors get nervous when there is resistance to their activities. They want to make it look like all their ducks are lined up and everybody's on board. There you go. Okay, so I am playbook. There's the playbook right there. It's amazing. They do the same thing over and over in every community. And if I hadn't gone to London, I would have had no idea. So the divide and conquer is one tactic. So what you need to do as a community, you need to band together. You need to also create the broadest coalition that you can. So we now have, you now have Kamloops Moms for Clean Air. We're hoping that because of Dr. Minch's visit that there might be British Columbia Doctors for Healthy Citizens or something along those lines. That could be another group. And then I'm sure you have um, the angler groups. I understood that the lakes that you have, there's going to be anglers who are not going to be motivated. There's cattle ranchers who are not going to want that mine. You need to reach out to all of those communities and band together and go then and negotiate with your city council, your mayor, your provincial leaders. You need to bring leaders from all those groups and you need to stand united against this project. Our city council has no balls. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I've met quite a few neutered city council members in my time. So. so then you know what you need to do? You go up to the next level. My apologies. I'm speaking in Utah. So my apologies. Um, so what you need to do then, go to city council. Then go to the next level. So Utah Moms for Clean Air, the first month we were uh, formed, we went right up and made a meeting with our governor. We met with our governor. We had moms that brought babies. We had nursing moms in that meeting. And we told them, we need clean air. Um, so I recommend that you actually even skip, in many ways, the local level and just go up higher. I don't know how your politics work, but you have the provincial le level, right? And then you have uh, the prime minister. And then you have the different levels of environmental regulation. You need to go to those organizations, United Citizenry. Okay. Well, it's, you've, got to, you've got to find people in there that are going to be sympathetic. And if they're not being sympathetic, you need to make a lot of noise in the media. You need to embarrass them. Because they are not standing up for what's right in this community more than likely. Okay. The next thing that the companies like to do, they are very wealthy. They have lots of money. And they're very happy to throw around um, the equivalent of what are nickels and dimes and quarters to us. Okay, Rio Tinto made a profit of over $14 billion last year. For them to put $10 million into this and $5 million into this and $3 million into that is like me putting $100 over here, $100 here, and $100 here. It has no impact on our family economy. Okay, so has that happened? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay, so are they funding sports teams? Yeah. Are they funding uh, school programs? Seniors. Are they seniors? Okay, so that's what they're going to do. They're going to start putting money in the community, and people that really care about those projects legitimately will say, well, we suddenly got $2 million, and we didn't have that $2 million before, so I'm just going to sort of ignore what's happening with the mine because I really care about the children that this $2 million is going to help. I really care about this million dollars that's going to underwrite sports teams because I really think that sports are so important for uh, our children's development. And I'm going to kind of now ignore this mine. Well, that's exactly what's happened in Salt Lake City, which is why Brian and I are two of the only people. I mean, actually, there is a larger coalition, but we are probably the two most vocal people against the mine because so many others cannot speak out about it because their jobs will be jeopardized. Okay? My husband has been chastised. He's a professor at the University of Utah Mechanical Engineering. He was department chair at the time when I wrote an op-ed saying there's no such thing as clean coal. He got called in by his dean and said, Professor Udell, you need to control your wife. <laughs> and which he said, Dean Brown, can you control your wife? <laughs> so that was the end of that conversation. Um, <clears throat> But my husband, as department chair, felt like he couldn't stand up and speak out about these issues because it would be jeopardizing um, funding that his colleagues were receiving. So he wasn't personally receiving it, but he has to work with these people every day. And he didn't want to jeopardize that. He does speak out a little bit, but he's very cautious about what he says. So we have that problem all across the universities. We have that problem across our media. We have that problem across all sorts of different institutions that would otherwise maybe stand up. Um, last year when we went to the shareholders meeting, Utah Moms for Clean Air, I put a notice out to all of our members, hey, if you want to go to London with us next year and, and meet the shareholders and speak to the CEO and board, then please come. So there was a mom named Christy who was an entomologist at our Natural History Museum. She wanted to go. Well, it just turned out Rio Tinto just built their new building. She actually felt like she had to ask permission from her boss at the Natural History Museum as an entomologist whether it was okay if she went to London to speak out at the shareholders meeting. Fortunately, her boss said yes. Um, in the end, she did not come, however. So it's, that is what you can expect if it hasn't happened already here in your community. So it sounds like it's already happening, and it's only, they're going to only put more money in more places. Okay? And you know what that is? That is silencing money. I hate to say it, but that is what it is. Okay? It's bribery, and it's silencing money. And I understand why people take it, because the causes they care about so deeply. I'm just telling you. This is the playbook. The next thing is bullying and intimidation. Okay? So uh, I was, I'm helping a mom fight. She's uh, in Wellsville, Utah, a little uh, small sort of country town off the highway. They're going to be putting in a, um, uh, they, there's a proposal to put in uh, an overnight truck stop with 32 stations. And the developer doesn't want to spend the money for the electric hookup, so he wants to allow these trucks to idle all night long. Now, as Dr. Minch has clearly delivered to you, um, diesel fuel is extremely toxic. It is a known carcinogen, and children that are chronically exposed to it have up to 600 times greater rate of getting childhood leukemia. This is absolutely unacceptable. There's a community right across the street where there are 90 children, literally across the street. So at the, at the city meeting, now, of course, this is not the mine, but this is an example of intimidation. So one mom got up and spoke out at the city council meeting, and she was called a bitch by the developer. Okay? It's already hard enough to go to these meetings, and it's a lot harder when in front of all your community members and on TV, well, because it wasn't recorded, but you're called names. Okay? When also you start getting threatening emails, threatening phone calls. Okay? That is what happens. Okay, um, when mining companies, pardon me? What's the MLA? Is that your? Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, this is another playbook tactic. Um, so Rio Tinto, um, they employ that in various forms in the different countries in which they operate. Um, the last year when I went to the Rio Tinto meeting, so I've been twice now, um, there was a woman that was there. Um, the mine wanted, um, they actually were right at the edge of her property. It offered to buy her property. She had refused. Um, 
She was at a meeting in Chicago, actually an environmental, um, I, I don't know exactly what the meeting was, something um, to do with environmental organization, organizing. Well, she was at that meeting speaking about how, at least in America, she felt like she was protected to speak out against the mines. While she was saying that, at her home back in Michigan, that was out in the woods, somewhat isolated, a knock on the door, husband answered, two men asked, are you against this mine? He said yes, and they beat the crap out of him and left him for dead. Oh. I'm not saying Rio Tinto did that, but someone associated with Rio Tinto did that. And that is what I'm talking about. Sometimes the intimidation gets to that degree. Um, fortunately, he survived and is fine. And if he hadn't survived, they would have never known what happened to him. But he was able to tell the story that it actually was two men that came and asked, are you, for, are you against this mine? Okay, so I don't know if that level of intimidation has happened. Don't be surprised if it does. And it might not actually be from someone um, it, it's probably not going to be from the company directly. It's going to be from someone who feels threatened. They need, they need a job, and they're feeling threatened that you are against them getting a job. And then they come out and retaliate. Um, I, from all the work that I do, Brian, also, we get threatening emails all the time. Um, fortunately, we get way more emails that are supportive. But just this week, again, I've gotten two or three emails that were veiled threats for the work that we're doing. So let's see. Okay, the next thing that the next thing in the playbook is what I call the camel's nose under the tent. Okay, so Rio Tinto it has been in our community for over a hundred years. So our mine is already there, and my position always, Utah Mom's position with that mine is we're not interested in closing the mine down. It's already there. It's providing jobs. It provides valuable commodities for the world that the world uses. I use copper that comes out of that mine undoubtedly in. For example, in my hybrid, requires copper. So lots of the things that we do, a lot of the modern technology, depends on the commodities coming out of these mines. All that you tell moms for clean air asks is that they just pay the true cost of doing their business and stop cutting corners and stop cheating so that they can make more profit to send back to London at our expense. Okay? But once the mine is in, it's very hard to shut it back down. And mines like to expand. And so I'm sure right now their little project is relatively small and what they're asking the permit for. It's pretty much guaranteed based on the history of Rio Tinto and all the other mines that we have looked at that there is going to be another permit in the future where they're going to want to expand just a little more over here and then there's going to be another one. We're just going to expand a little more over here and before you know it, that entire hillside over there that you love is going to be decimated. It's already in plan. Okay. So camel nose under the tent. Once they get in, they're in. We're dealing with the other end. Okay. The bump. Okay. So nothing against camels. They're wonderful animals. Actually, I was just telling Brian when I was in Egypt traveling, some man offered to buy me for 100 camels. And I wasn't sure if I should be, um, um, if I should have been flattered or offended. I wasn't sure. Flattered? Okay. So. As an example with Rio Tinto, um, they have, in the last hundred years, they have had countless expansions and they have displaced 10,000 people and destroyed multiple towns. Okay? And now they're asking for another permit to expand another 30%. Okay? And what's interesting is another tactic they'll do, they'll say, oh, we know we're creating a lot of extra air pollution, but if you let us expand, We'll mitigate that and you'll have even less air pollution. We'll expand, but you're going to benefit with, even the le with less air pollution. In which case, my husband recently said, isn't that kind of holding the community hostage? They know the air pollution is toxic and dangerous. They know that it's killing people. But they're not going to actually put in the control technology that is needed unless we approve the expansion. That sounds like tactics that the mob would be using. So. The other thing that I learned in, that one is yours, Brian. Um, the other thing that I learned, and I'm almost done here because I know it's been a long time that you guys have been sitting, is um, meeting all these other communities in London. What I realized that they don't, even though in their literature, Rio Tinto says they have a standard of operating practice ethic, um, what we found is that actually in every community where they're operating, 
they do different things, some of them more egregious than others. So one of the plus things that I learned about Utah is we're actually one of the best case scenarios. That's because it's the United States of America and there are certain standards. We have an EPA. We do have some regulatory oversight. But a country like Indonesia, there's barely anything. And we, I met a tribal leader. He was, he was dressed actually all in his tribal gear, you know, the, 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 the headdress with the feathers. Um, incredible man, described the story of how um, Rio Tinto people had come into his community because they had refused to move and they burnt, they said you have 10 minutes to get out, get your belongings and get out of here, we're burning the town down and that's exactly what they did. Now that could never happen in Salt Lake City, Utah. You know, they're gonna, if they're going to displace people, they're going to have to pay, they're going to have to, there's going to have to be a process. We would not allow in America for a company to come in in the year 2013 and tell people they have 10 minutes to get out of their homes and then burn them down. In Indonesia, that's allowed. So that's what they did. Okay? So what I learned is that the community where the mine is operating sets the bar, sets the expectations of behavior. And so what I say in Utah is, yeah, Indonesia is way down here, right? And thank God we're not. Our bar is not that low. Our bar is here. But why is it not up here? The mine can't pick up and move in a huff. If we say we want this, this, and this, they can't pack up the mine and move. That mine is so profitable that they could implement every single requirement that we ask and they would still make a profit. Why don't we ask them? How is that not good for the Utah economy? How is asking them to put in the full pollution abatement controls that would require, that would create thousands of jobs and bring in hundreds of million dollars to the Utah economy. How is that bad for our economy? And that's unfortunately where our political leaders are. Well, we have to choose between clean air or a strong economy. So I want to take this moment to just say that no, you don't. That is a false choice. It's set up by industry to make people think and also to create that division that it's jobs. Or it's, a clean, or it's clean air, and then it gets people pitted against each other in the community, and then you cannibalize yourselves, okay? It doesn't have to be that. So many reports in the U.S. have shown that actually protecting the air actually ends up creating more jobs and more benefits. So I'll give you a couple examples. Arden Pope, who is the um, person who did, he's an economist at Brigham Young University, um, one of the premier e um, economists on air pollution. Um, his uh, research actually underwrote the Clean Air Act that we have in America. He recently released a report that said for every dollar spent on, on pollution abatement, $10 are saved in health care costs. Tell me how that's not good for the economy. It's maybe not good for the doctor's economy, right? <laughs> Ooh, sorry. <laughs> um, but actually, we know, yeah, that, but we know that's not, not obviously the truth. We don't care about that. Um, doctors aren't in it for money. So, um, <laughs> as you know, as you mentioned before, his bank account is empty, right? So, um, so for every dollar spent in pollution abatement, $10 is saved in health care costs. See, the problem is if it was Rio Tinto that spent a dollar on pollution abatement and they saved $10 in health care costs, it would have been solved a long time ago. But it's Rio Tinto that has to pay the dollar in pollution abatement and it's the community that saves the $10. So that is where the disconnect is, okay? There's another EPA report that came out that uh, assessed the Clean Air Act in America over the last couple decades. So it was looking at, okay, we enacted this um, act, what has been the outcome? And one of the things that came out of that report, first off, is that it was the most, in public, most important public policy, public, excuse me, the most important public health policy tool ever implemented in America. More lives were saved from that act than from anything else that America's ever done on a public policy level. Two, for every dollar spent on pollution abatement, 30 to $90 of benefit went to the community. So included in that are health care costs, included in that are um, uh, not having your um, property values devalued, et cetera, et cetera. So for every dollar spent in pollution cleanup, 30 to $90 of benefit went to the community. So again, tell me how cleaning up the air is not good for the economy. What, what, what is really trying to be said is cleaning up the air is not good for Rio Tinto's economy. Okay?
But that's pure greed, because that company made $14 billion last year, and a big chunk of those billions came from our mine in Utah. They can afford to do the cleanup. And if they do, they're actually going to create more jobs. So don't let that argument divide the community. Okay, that's also another warning, because they will use that. I'm sure you've already heard it. So, um, so I'm just going to tie up with, um, I love this quote, and I'm totally blanking on his name. Thank you. <laughs> Frederick Douglass, thank you. Um, so find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you have the exact measure of the injustice and wrong which will be imposed on them. So you as a community need to find out again where that bar is. I told you where the bar is in Indonesia. And I imagine that as an educated population in a democracy, that your bar needs to be much higher. And is that the last slide or was there one more? Yeah, so, and that's, um, so that's just my, um, my last uh, thoughts to leave with you. And um, I think we're going to be, there's a brown bag that I'm going to be doing, which will be more of a general conversation on Tuesday. Is it Tuesday? And then I also suggested to Gina that we have a strategy session before I go that I can share with you the things that we have learned that have been successful um, in Salt Lake City in fighting the Rio Tinto mine, um, as well as other issues with air pollution. So I guess now we're opening up to questions, if there are any.